Hello, all. welcome to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. Now, you know, we do a lot, um, not just talking about what's going on in public safety, but we talk about how we liaison with our partners. We talk about other agencies within our catchment area that's really doing some extraordinary things. And today, we have Bob Rivers, who is the CEO of Eastern Bank, to talk to us about social advocacy, talk to us about issues of importance when you talk about civic engagement, social engagement, not just for himself, but also on the part of the bank. And Eastern Bank has really been engaged pretty mightily within communities of color. And so without any further ado, Bob, Great, Steve, thanks. thanks for coming on. Really thanks for appreciate that. Appreciate the invitation. So let's start with this. What is, um, what is a mutual bank? Tell people what mutual banks are versus any other type of bank. So a mutual bank is essentially one that doesn't have any shareholders at all. In fact, no one owns Eastern Bank or any other mutual or cooperative bank. Um, essentially, as senior managers in the board, we're custodians of our capital base mm -hmm. that we attempt to grow to really further our business, which also helps further our mission. Uh, mutual banks have been around for a long time. Okay. Uh, we were the third mutual established in the United States 200 years ago. Wow. So we're celebrating our bicentennial this year. Nice. So we've been delving into a lot of the history of certainly uh, Eastern, uh, but many other banks, those that we've partnered with along the way, and mm -hmm. many others that are mutuals. Mutuals are, a, are sadly sort of a, a dying part of, of the industry. Uh, out of 6,000 or so banks, mutuals today are less than 600. Because essentially no one wants to start a business and not own a piece of it. Uh, really, when we were started, we were started by wealthy business people in Salem, okay. Massachusetts, okay. who okay. put their own capital together. Okay. Uh, it was a time there was no national banking system, there was no national currency, mm. and mm. pretty much wow. no one had access to any sort of banking but them. Okay. So it was a real situation of the 99% and the 1%, maybe even the less than 1% then. Okay. But that less than 1% recognized that it wasn't right and it wasn't smart not to have really everyone else have access to a safe place to save mm -hmm. or to borrow money. Uh, they didn't think of it in terms of a social justice um, terms, although they were fairly altruistic themselves. Mm -hmm. But really the motivator also was it was a smart thing for them to do. Again, 1818, country really young at that point, sure. in its earliest years. Sure. So they recognized in order to develop their businesses, grow their businesses, which were largely as ship merchants, uh, shop owners, mm -hmm. uh, attorneys that supported those businesses, their economy, their own businesses weren't going to grow unless they had a much freer flow of capital Makes here uh, starting in, in Salem, Massachusetts at the time. So, question, two-part question. One, is Eastern Bank a regional bank or a national bank? We're certainly not a national bank. Okay. Uh, I'm not even sure if we're a regional bank. Our footprint of about 120 or so locations is pretty much within Eastern Massachusetts. So that's defined certainly well within the 495 belt, one, mm -hmm. most of which is within the 128 belt. Mm -hmm. uh, we have now a uh, presence in southern and coastal New Hampshire okay. and uh, some presence in Rhode Island. So I'm not sure if that makes us a regional bank. We still think of ourselves very much as a community bank, uh, a very local organization. Okay. And so, Now, like some of the other, I don't know if you call them commercial banks or big, bigger banks, big, too big to fail banks, right? Do mutual uh, banks also merge and buy one another and, and combine their capital like other banks do? In some ways, yes. So certainly we do merge uh, and sometimes acquire other banks. But because no one owns Eastern, no one owns other mutuals and cooperative banks, mm -hmm. no consideration can be paid for a mutual or a cooperative bank. So when we have merged okay. with other mutuals and cooperative banks, it's very much a social transaction, much like if two nonprofits were to merge. Got you. Uh, so no money exchanges hands. It's really to help further the business and the mission on a combined basis. It's a social transaction, so mm -hmm. it's a lot harder to do. Mm -hmm. Although we are able to acquire other banks, we have no stocks, we pay cash, but certainly we have acquired a number of public companies, mm -hmm. uh, public banks, uh, insurance agencies, if you will, mm -hmm. for cash. So, um, so unlike a lot of public companies out there, we can't purchase another company with stock. We don't have any. Sure. But conversely, no one can buy us right. either. And we're also oh. the largest mutual in the country, in oh. addition to being the oldest. Okay. Uh, so uh, the chances of us being in a situation where 
it would be advantageous uh, to merge uh, with another institution um, isn't really foreseeable. So as chairman and CEO, do you set the direction for the bank, or is that a collaborative effort also? Oh, it's certainly a collaborative effort. Okay. It really starts with uh, our senior leadership, which is our board uh, and your, our senior management team. Okay. So certainly I have a strong hand in that, uh, but so do a number of others, uh, starting with our lead director, Deborah Jackson. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you know Debbie. I don't, yeah, Debbie's great. Yeah, it's yeah. president over at uh, Cambridge, Cambridge College. College. That's right. Right, That's right, right. Yeah. No, doing some great things over yeah, there. Yeah, she sure yeah, is. That, great yeah. things with us. She's been on our board for 20 years. Uh, wow. She succeeded. I didn't know uh, that. Wendell Knox uh, no Wendell. Uh, stepped down as our lead director at the end of last year. Yeah. Uh, and Deborah became uh, our lead director. They're going to overlap for a year. Wendell retires from our board at the end of this year. Okay. Uh, but Deborah has been our uh, lead director since the beginning uh, of this year. So one of the hallmarks of both your career and the bank is social advocacy. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that. What is that actually? What is the granular? What does that mean? What do you guys do? Well, certainly f uh, from an institutional perspective, uh, our our roots in community service, um, community engagement, go back to the very beginning. You know, as I mentioned, we were we were founded by individuals that understood that unless we could better engage the community, it wasn't going to be good for the health of the community, the health of the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, when we first opened on April 15th of 1818, in those early days, we were only open one hour a week. And it was noon to one on a Wednesday. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. And those individuals, uh, those wealthy individuals I mentioned who put up their own <laughs> capital for the bank, they staffed it themselves. Oh, really? Okay. So okay. they came in uh, and staffed it during that lunch hour and basically said to the community, they offered a 5% passbook. Mm -hmm. Think about wow. that. 1818, 5% okay. wow. yeah, passbook. Okay, yeah. Big deal. Yeah. Right? Obviously, uh, inflation <laughs> hasn't helped interest How rates. How about that? Go, man. Good luck finding one of those really, today. Really? But 5% uh, passbook and what was an early precursor to a residential mortgage loan so people, people okay. could buy homes. So okay. Those are the two products. And they came in and basically what they said to the community is, we're here for you. Uh, if you take advantage of those products, though, you have to volunteer so we can expand oh. the hours and serve more people. Cool. So uh, when I think back to one of the things we take a lot of pride in, you know, we have 1,900 employees today. Right. Uh, and our combined community service hours of 60,000 hours a year by those 1,900 employees is the largest of any company in Greater Boston. Wow. So awesome. that community service ethos goes all the way back to the beginning where you had to volunteer at the bank right. to take advantage of the services. Uh, our philanthropy, uh, a philanthropic focus came later. Okay. I mean, certainly those individuals put up their own money to start the bank. But back in 1999, so almost 20 years ago now, we started giving 10% of our net income to charity. Uh, that's been over $115 million since then. That is incredible. Uh, and uh, is incredible. it's a real hallmark for what we've done. Yeah. Today, we serve over 1,600 nonprofits. Yeah. And this past year, uh, we gave out $9 million in actual cash grants into that's the awesome. community. Right. And then more recently, and this is one that's really been close to my heart personally, because when I joined the bank, we had this long two-century community service culture. Mm -hmm. And we had a two-decade-long building philanthropic platform. But really for me, the way I looked to build upon what we were doing mission-wise was being an outspoken advocate on behalf of issues that are important to us. Mm -hmm. Again, under the principle of yeah. right and smart. It's the right thing to do. Right but also it's a smart thing to do. And because what we're doing is we're appealing to others in the private sector, other businesses, to say, come and join us. You know, whether it's the right thing to you for you could resonate higher or lower, right. but we always know doing the smart thing, particularly for someone's pocketbook, sure. is always going to ring the meter every time sure. and it make it sustainable. So we appeal to our advocacy on both measures to get others to join us, uh, but certainly so much of what we have in advocacy uh, starts with right. For me, as someone who uh, is named after Robert F. Kennedy here in the 50th anniversary of, of his, sad, uh, his sad death, um, mm -hmm. someone who grew up knowing that, read a lot about him, it mm -hmm. fueled my fire, many personal experiences, friendships, relationships, 
I've had over the years have only added to that. So when I came to the company 12 years ago, right. I was very much of the mind of wanting to further what I saw Eastern was doing in community what service. What position Atlanta. did you come in as? So I came in as president. Okay. Uh, so at the time, our longtime CEO, Stan Lukowski, was about to retire. Okay. Rich Holbrook, our prior CEO, mm -hmm. uh, was and the president, yep. going to be succeeding Stan. They were looking for someone to come in in the president role. Uh, they were looking for someone who was at least 10 years younger than Rich, okay. because Rich was 10 years younger than Stan. Okay. And likewise, back uh, now almost two years ago, I did the same thing, and I went out and found my successor as the next CEO of Eastern, mm -hmm. Quincy mm -hmm. Miller, mm -hmm. good man. who I've known for 20 years. Yeah, good man. Uh, Quincy good man. and I go back to days in New York, right. and then more recently in Pennsylvania, and then he moved to Massachusetts and uh, with Citizens and came over and joined us. And uh, there were many things that made Quincy the right person to be the current president of Eastern. Mm -hmm. uh, not the least of which, though, is he was the right age. Because mm -hmm. uh, Quincy's uh, gotcha. 10 gotcha. years younger than I am. Gotcha, gotcha. In addition to being a super talented guy, and I think you've met Quincy. Oh, yeah, yeah, on a number of occasions. He's a great guy. And you know, one of the things, folks, that I will say about Bob is that I've seen you out there. I mean, you really walk the walk. Well, you know, yeah. you're not just kind of fronting it for lack of a better way of saying it. you really roll up your sleeves and you really get engaged and involved and when you think about banking whether it's mutual or some other type of banking you basically people think banking they think well, how much money can we make you know yeah. and you really get out there roll up your sleeves and really make sure that you're giving back and that the bank is giving back to the communities that you're servicing and I got I gotta applaud you for that because you don't right. always see that particularly in big businesses. Well, it's kind of you say that, Steve. I mean, it is, again, you've known me long enough to know this is a deep, is a, yeah. it's truly a labor of love for me. Yeah. And it's fueled by a lot of passion behind things that I get involved with, which are, which are many. Uh, because I see a role that I can play, that the company can play. And for us, making money is a way to build our capital base. One, it builds the charitable foundation, because mm -hmm. 10% of that earnings mm -hmm. go in the charitable foundation. But by furthering the interests of the bank allows us to do other things in terms of lending yeah. uh, in the community and communities where there isn't a whole lot of lending yeah, going on sometimes. a lot, right? In fact, uh, once again, I applaud you because I think you just opened up a branch in Roxbury. We did, and yeah. not a heck of a lot of a bank. A lot of banks are in Roxbury proper. What was the what was the impetus behind that? Well, back uh, when I joined the company um, again in uh, 06, uh, we were in the midst at the time of a Metro West expansion, like many other banks okay. then and now. Okay. Uh, in fact, I had just moved to the town of Needham. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And Eastern was putting up a branch in Needham. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, stop the project, get rid of the lease. It was actually the first decision I made with the bank. Wow. Get rid of the lease, because Needham doesn't need more banks. Gotcha. And that was, I think, four or five banks ago. Gotcha. Uh, uh, Danvers Savings picked up the lease. It's now they're long gone. So right. it's now a People's United branch. <laughs> I wanted us to start opening in branches in, in branches and communities that hadn't had them in a long yeah. time. So yeah. we went yeah. in 08. We were at Chelsea first in 10 mm -hmm. years. We mm -hmm. went to Lawrence. We were the first in over two decades. And now wow. we have two there. Nice. Back, of, uh, back about four years ago now, this is an event. Um, that we host uh, over at Daryl's place, Daryl's Kitchen and Corner sure. Bar. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, and it was always with the community to talk about what we were trying to do to move the needle in serving, particularly communities of color, but businesses of color. Okay. Always did it in May. That's huge. Part of Small Business That's Month. That's huge. Yep. And um, brought the community together, and I used it as our report card. And I'd say to people every year. Um, you know, there's nothing more important than the weight of accountability. Right. I'm not here to have you tell us nice things about us, uh, which is appreciated, obviously. But what I'm he hearing is, hold us our feet to the fire. There we is. say we're going to do something. We're yeah. going to do it. Yeah. And I need you to hold me accountable. And so one of the things I said four years ago was, we're going to open up a branch in Roxbury. And when we do, we'll be the first in two, two decades mm -hmm. to come to this community. And God, it took a lot longer than I expected. Uh, there were a couple places we tried to get into, couldn't. Finally found this wonderful location in partnership with Metropolitan Housing Partnership mm -hmm. um, right, across, um, right across the street from the Roxbury Crossing T Station. Yep. You know, yep. you know there because well. you came yep. to our party. That's right, that's right. And uh, so proud to be there uh, at long last uh, in that community. But that's been a pattern for the last decade of where we're looking to open and so that if you look at where our markets to open again are 
you know, Seaport's beautiful, but the Seaport ain't one of them. Yeah. Uh, right, you know, right, we're looking at communities right, like right, Framingham, right. for example, or others on the south coast. And the coast. key word you just said is communities. Right. That's the, that's the key Indeed. word not to cut you off. Let me, let me ask you about the American dream, you know, that, that ideal that says uh, all U.S. citizens should have the opportunity to achieve success and prosperity mm -hmm. through hard work and determination. Yeah, right. A moment ago, you referenced the 99% versus the 1%. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of wealth disparities indeed rampant throughout the country yeah yep. you've had a you travel a lot I, I get back and forth and what I've noticed is it appears that not just on the East Coast but the West Coast also that our homeless population is really growing and getting right. out of control that's right how does a bank a mutual bank a bank like yours with all that you guys do philanthropically and commute with a community kind of civic engagement hat on address the wealth disparities amongst folk that live in the country yeah, there's, uh, you're, you're so right about that. It's very distressing. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, we're making progress as a country mitigating that. We're not. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very concerned about, you know, technological advances are great. Artificial intelligence is sexy. But my belief is it's going to destroy more jobs than it creates and destroy them for people who really need them. That's right. And so I'm very worried about this issue. We address it in a lot of ways. I mean, as you know, you well know, you do this work every day. Right. Uh, you know, I play this on TV. You do this work right. every day, you know. <laughs> okay. And, uh, but so you know it's a system. It's part of a system. And, and many things that lead to it in terms of community health, uh, housing affordability and availability. Right. Many things, uh, uh, education or lack thereof, yeah. workforce training make up this system. One of the things that we're working on right now, we looked at the system, we donate lots of philanthropically to partners who are doing this work, who know what they're doing there. But we thought about what could we do as well, we brought our intellectual capital, mm -hmm. as well as our financial capital to something that we could help with. So uh, about 18 months ago, we set up a separate foundation. Uh, we've had the Eastern Bank Charitable Foundation okay. for 20 years, as I've mentioned. Right. But we took $10 million out of the Eastern Bank Charitable Foundation and set up the Foundation for Business Equity. And oh, really what the okay. Foundation for Business Equity is designed to do uh, is really help uh, address the wealth and income gap, uh, particularly between uh, whites and people of color. Right in a way that we could bring something where we know something about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're one of the largest small business lenders actually in the country, nice. even though we're a local community bank. Right. Uh, but just shows how much we're doing there with the SBA and others. And we said, well, that's something that we know. And what we've noticed is that the, the black business community in particular, uh, in terms of numbers of companies, size of companies, has actually gone backwards in the last several decades. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the mm -hmm. community here mm -hmm. in Roxbury, not nearly as thriving as it once yeah, was. No doubt. And we drive down the street and see some of the faded signs, and there are many reminders of what this community once That's was. Right. That's right, Bob. And so trying to get to the root of what causes that and what keeps that from coming back. So what we decided to do is take the $10 million and focus on a few things. And really, uh, there were five things that all begin with the letter C. Because they like alliteration. Right. I'm a Peter Drucker fan, so I like things <laughs> right, in five. Right. Well, the first was commitment. We were going to put up a $10 million commitment to get at this. Uh, the second was capital. Uh, as, a, as a bank lender, we know uh, how hard it is to make loans to certain businesses, right. even when you're trying. That's right. Even when you have lots of government programs, you can move along the continuum, you only get so far. At some level, you need outright grants or lower new interest loans, and on the other end of the spectrum, you need access to venture capital. Okay. Another thing that ha is, a, is, a, is very apparent in terms of racial inequality is access to venture capital. Because these folks over here don't know these folks here in the community right. and who lend to. So how do That's we right. help address that? So we've set up uh, something called the Business Equity Fund. We went over to uh, the Boston Foundation. We seeded mm -hmm. it with two million bucks, and we asked them to raise money for it to build it to at least a fifty million dollar to a hundred million dollar fund, using their donor base to invest in companies here in our community. Wow! With a particular focus on Black and Latino businesses. That is awesome. Now, is there a time parameter with which they have to raise those funds? Five years, ten years, twenty well, years? Well, often running. So you know Orlando Watkins I over know there well. has been leading yeah. the band yeah, uh, the along with Paul Grogan yep, and. Yep. Uh, it was at a very exciting meeting there recently. You know, we took a long time to sort of put the particulars of the fund together because mm -hmm. we're going to make it investor ready. Mm -hmm. uh, we've already done our first deal, though. 
No. Uh, so we're nice. already doing deals, and one of the nice. real push and raising money is nice. we get we get a nice pipeline of deals. Good. The Good. pipeline of deals, one of the sources of the pipeline of deals, comes from the business equity initiative. That's the other thing. So we also know we needed capacity. There are great programs out there. Uh, Steve Grossman's ICIC, mm -hmm. uh, Next Street, mm -hmm. uh, Interise. Mm -hmm. They're great programs. Mm -hmm. uh, Glenn Lloyd, who leads the Foundation for Business Equity, mm -hmm. brought him in. He's the mastermind behind all oh, of this. Oh, Glenn's the man. He's the best. He's, the He's amazing. That's and right. so Glenn, having gone through those programs as a successful entrepreneur, That's right. building City Fresh Foods, That's right. which is now run by his brother Sheldon, yep. um, He what he knew was he could create something that picked up where those left off, those classroom programs. So he created the business equity initiative where companies apply of a certain size to come into it. They get an embedded strategic advisor one-to-one -to, -one to help Whoa. them scale. We have just, uh, we have just uh, brought in or about to announce our third cohort of companies. So we've done cohorts of 10 every six months. Okay. We've got 20 in, about to have another 10 in. That's been building the pipeline for the fund. Okay. But 10 and 10 and 10 and 30 is all good. But how do we go bigger? Yeah. So we've got commitment, we've got oh capital, God. we've got yep. capacity. Yep. But what we really need, we need contracts. Gotcha. We need the big businesses led by people that look like me gotcha. to say they're going to commit to increase their spend and the opportunity to businesses of color. That's awesome. So uh, Jim Rooney in the Paysetter Program at the yep. Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce yep. Paysetter Program yep. did, uh, adopted a very successful model out of Cincinnati, has built it here in Boston and is bringing together and matching those large companies uh, with smaller companies with a focus on black and Latino businesses to get them connected, and we're starting to get some success there, too. You know, so one of the things that I'm impressed with, the names that you've just laid out, you know, Orlando and Glenn and Jimmy, and these, I mean, these are community guys. Mm -hmm. These are community guys, yeah. and they really do get it, you know, right, which, sure is, which is awesome. It's, I, I'm heartened by the fact that you didn't bring in people from outside to say, okay, let's kind of, you know, do what we do and think about how we do what we do, and this is a nice, cute thing for a, right. a short period of time. Indeed. You're bringing in people, you have people working that are invested in these communities, yeah. which I think is like crazy. Good. Well, it's right and smart again, right? It's not only the right thing to do to start in your own community, but it's smart. Who knows our communities in terms of the constituents we're trying That's to right. engage That's right. better than Glenn? Exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, better than um, certainly Orlando, yeah. than Paul, yeah. than Jim Jimmy. Rooney. That's right. Exactly. Because we're not trying to engage those in the community. Yeah. We're trying to get, the again, the folks that lead bigger businesses, like myself, yeah. engage in this effort. And the last C is collaboration. So it's, again, it's commitment, it's That's capital, sweet. it's sweet. capacity, um, it's contracts, but it's collaboration. So we all come together, all of those parties, and we have an, uh, a Foundation for Business Equity Advisory Board that includes... Uh, Everyone from uh, Havas Rojas from the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Carolyn Crockett, Crockett mm -hmm. here in the city of Boston, mm -hmm. representatives of Axion, SBA, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mass Growth Capital, Smart. Larry Andrews, all Smart. of those folks that Smart. know this so much Smart. better than Smart. we do. Smart. So we're very excited. This is in its still its early stages, but this is a long run effort. And we've started with $10 million, but we're in the middle of raising more money, as I mentioned, for all of those pieces to sustain this. Well, we only have a few moments left. For people that are hearing this, I can see their ears perking up. How do small businesses get in the pipeline for this? Or do you do the outreach, or do they contact you? How does that work? It really works both ways, but okay. we'd, we'd be delighted to have people contact us. And you can go right on, uh, if you go under Google Business Equity Initiative, okay. or you could reach out to, um, to Glenn. Mm -hmm. uh, at g.lloyd mm -hmm. um, at easternbank.com uh, or myself at 617-897-1031. Actually, one of the, one of the things that, that would really be helpful to us is developing, continue to develop a pipeline because we've got a long-term yeah. effort here. Yeah. So, so, you know, identifying and hearing from, say, the first hundred or so companies for BEI, right. we know who they are. Right. But after some period of time, this, and we're discovering them all the time as we read and walk around That's and great. things like this. That's great. Well, look, Bob, thanks for coming on today. Well, thanks I mean, for having me. Appreciate really, the really, opportunity. Yeah, I really appreciate talking uh, talking to you about these sort of things. And love to invite you back because I really want to talk about yeah. the furtherance of the country and where the country is going. You know, definitely, you know, in commerce, but politically also. Yeah, you know, sure. I'm, 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 I'm a, an internal, like, what do you call it, eternal 
enthusiastic type of individual, mm -hmm. but I'm also very concerned with what's going Indeed. on nationally Indeed. and globally. And yeah. so I'd love to have you come back. I'd love to come back. Thanks. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks again. Appreciate it. All right, folks, look, that's our show for today. It's been great. Bob is one of those guys that really gets it, and he's surrounded himself with people that also get it. So give their bank a look. Go to their website. Call them up. Talk to them about what it is that you want to do and what they're doing, and see if you can't find some synergies. We're out of here. We'll be back again next week. Until then, you take care of yourself. Peace.